Okay, this is a kind of journal entry on the book of Jude. What I'm trying to establish is why God wanted it in canon. And in order to do that, I got to go through the kind of rules that the Bible itself tells you are used to prove a book is canon. Forget the Council of Nicaea and the whole Catholic thing. God proves his own word as his word in his word. Okay, in other words, anybody could pick up the Gospel of Thomas and realize it's a mad magazine book and it's not canon. Anybody can pick up, which is going to be relevant to this video, the so-called book of Enoch and realize that Alfred E. Newman actually wrote it. Alfred E. Newman is the guy in Mad Magazine. I grew up on Mad Magazine when it first came out when I was a kid. It was one of my favorite books. That and H.G. Wells in the comic book version. Bible books that are real Bible books portray themselves and prove themselves as being Bible books in the very text. But there is a procedure that every Bible book follows. And what I'm doing here is I need to test Jude for that. Okay? One of the first tests is he has to be able to show that he's referencing all the prior canon. Okay? And that's not too hard. I mean, you read this for yourself if you want. But, you know, everything he's saying in here is doctrinally correct based on all the other Bible we got. So it passes that test. All right. The next test is he's got to establish sequence. Where is his book relative to other books in the Bible? Okay. And beginning about here, even including the Enoch quote and all the rest of it. It's not necessarily a quote, by the way. All the way through down here. He's constantly making reference to other Bible verses, particularly, and this is what's so important, 2 Peter 2. His whole letter, and this is the third test, there has to be a coherence to the letter. It has to be pointing with a theme to something else in the Bible on which it elaborates. That's the most important role of a Bible book test most important test of a Bible book is what particular theme in this book is going to elaborate it's a very important word elaborate on what other Bible book or books that's its job a new Bible book is written because new information about something you already know is coming out and he's got to hook incorporate by reference, tag back to, tie to other passages in scripture you already know to give you the new information you now need to know. Okay? That's the most important test of a Bible book. What elaboration is this book giving me? It's got to be an elaboration or it's or it, it, there's no it, it could just be a sermon. Okay, it has to elaborate on something that was not disclosed in scripture before. Okay, you with me on that? <clears throat> so what is Jude doing here? Okay, Jude is definitely playing on 2 Peter 2. If you were to put 2 Peter 2, I can't do that because I'm having trouble with my video recorder. If you were to put 2 Peter 2 right alongside Jude 1, you would see that Jude is tracking, tracking to 2 Peter. Okay, since this is such a short letter, and I'm trying to keep the video short too, I'm just going to go through it. Okay, first of all, Jude is servant of James. That means James is dead. Okay, he's writing after James' death for sure. Now, Depending on who you talk to, James died somewhere 62, 64, 66. 
and some even speculated that because of the whole you know brouhaha with James which is recorded in Acts 22 um, that you know that's why the, the Romans came to besiege Jerusalem that could be I could spend a lot of time on the validity of that idea but I'm not going to because I'm just trying to concern myself with the content of the book what establishes it is Bible okay the fact that he's a physical brother of James that's also very easily pro proven Jude means Judas Judas means Judah James means Jack Jacob okay I can prove that really quickly see Judas is Judas Okay, Judas is not like Judas Iscariot. Judas is an Aramaic version of Judah, who was named after, you know, the, one of the first, you know, one of the sons of Jacob. Okay, but because everybody was naming their brothers the same thing, their kids the same thing, these variations, you know, like we say Jack and John, right? It's kind of like that. Okay, and then we have Jacob, which is the name for James. James is a concatenation of Jacob because everybody and his brother was named Jacob as an honorary thing. You know, you name your kids something. Like I was named after one of the people in the Bible too because my parents wanted me to be like that person. Okay? You know, in, my, in real life. So, you know, that's why they did it. So Jude is to distinguish him from all the other Judases. Okay? And James is to distinguish him from all the other Jacobs. Okay, brother of James. All right, so he's establishing his own identity. It means James is dead. It means Jude was head of the Jerusalem church. But since he's quoting Peter, and Peter's in diaspora, that was the last letter, Second Peter 2 is the last letter Peter wrote before he died. We have to date this letter somewhere in the vicinity, and this is what I'm trying to establish, of 68 AD at the earliest because that's when that's about when Peter wrote Peter Peter died as a consequence of Nero Nero wrote to Mithridates I think that was the name of the guy in Persia who was his new best friend and wanted to extend the the persecution of the Christians and that's why Peter died Peter was in Babylon and Persia the the so-called Persian kings had control over the Babylonian territory at that time. You find that out in the end of 1 Peter, the very end. Okay, so Peter though had died after Paul because Peter's writing about Paul in the past tense in 2 Peter 3.15 and the book of Hebrews is writing about Paul also in the past tense. So Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 13.23. At the end of 2 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, Hi, Timothy, I need you to come here. I'm going to die. Bring the, bring the Bible books, bring my cloak, and bring Mark. Now, if Mark is the same Mark as at the end of 1 Peter in Babylon, then that means James, will, I mean, uh, Timothy went all the way to Babylon, picked up Mark, went back to Rome where Paul was, but not Peter, Otherwise, Peter wouldn't be writing a letter the way he does. He would be saying something about Paul in the letter because he'd be where Paul was. All right? So Peter's not in Rome. All right, so then Timothy went back with Mark and then got imprisoned with Paul and Mark and then got released, and that's Hebrews 13.23. So the question in my mind is, is Jude referring not only to 2 Peter 2, but to the book of Hebrews? Because I have to figure out if it comes before or after the book of Hebrews. It comes after Peter. Peter makes only a couple of very small references to stuff in the book of Hebrews. So I can't really be sure that Peter is coming out after the book of Hebrews. But he is, he is writing after Paul's dead. And the book of Hebrews is after Paul's dead. The book of Hebrews is written in a hurry. Jude is written in a hurry. Peter's letters are also written in a hurry, especially 2 Peter. And it's in 2 Peter 1.12 that we find out Peter knows he's going to die. Just like Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy he was going to die. 
So it seems like this thing is coming out in pretty rapid succession. All right, but but there are things about the book of Jude that make me think it comes out later. In other words, after Peter, after book of Hebrews, but maybe just before John. Because John doesn't reference Jude. And that's a problem. Okay, or it doesn't seem to reference Jude. Anyway, to those who have been called, okay, blah, blah, blah. All right, this is a standard greeting. Nothing telling you the time. The other thing I checked is that these two verses are not metered. Repeat, not metered. In the Greek, the total number of syllables is 54. Now that's a pregnant number, but it is 54. It's pregnant because in Daniel 9:25 through 27, God metered verses using Daniel's own meter style to, to relate the story about the 490, okay? And he's using the 490 meter style, as did Moses, as did Isaiah, as did Daniel. And 54 in that passage is a, is a real pregnant verse about how time was going to go into abeyance. Okay? that Which is now we know is the church age, but Daniel wasn't necessarily told that it was the church age. Okay? Daniel was just told there would be a hiatus in those verses. Okay, so if Jude is keying off that, that's going to be real important. The Apostle John does the same sort of thing in his first two verses, his first verse of Revelation 1, where he uses 58, which is also pregnant in Daniel 9. Okay, so I have to investigate that. It might be on purpose, and it might just be, well, that's just the number of syllables in Greek. Okay, if it's done on purpose... That would establish Judas canon, period. Okay, I mean, well, you know, he meets the other test, too. All right, dear friends, now this is really important. This word eager is a is a Petrine word, spudazo. Okay, spudas. All right. Dear friends, so I was very eager to write you about salvation we share. Okay? In other words, he was going to write about salvation. We're going to write some kind of epistle about growing in Christ, la, la, la. So he's saying he's being interrupted. It was incumbent on me, is really how we ought to translate this. It became incumbent on me to write and urge you to contend for the doctrine. This should be translated doctrine. That's the first meaning of faith in the Bible, is the doctrine, the content. Not your believing in it, but the content that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Now this is a really big issue here. Please tell me I'm still recording. Um, this was a really big issue here because um, the implication is that canon is complete. All right. The word here is hapox and I, I don't want to go through the Greek exactly, but this once for all business he uses the term twice he uses the term a second time here and the manuscripts differ as to where the word once is placed I'm using the NIV translation for Jude because it's more correct than the other ones in the NIV translation they're using manuscripts which put the word once in you know as a, a positive to know in other words you already knew know this and so the NIV is translating once already, which is a decent translation, if that's where the word once should be put. But the other, the other, trans, the other texts put once right after Lord, so it would be the Lord once delivered his peoples out of Egypt. He's making an issue of once, okay? It's just, the word is actually just once, but it's an idiom once for, for all. In other words, there's only one time it happens, and it never has to happen again. Okay? So is he basically telling you that what he's writing is canon by using this term? Or is he making a different point? Now, there are scholars who interpret this to mean that when Jude writes, all canon was completed. If that were true, 
then this is not a Bible book. Okay? It would just be a sermon or an encouraging letter or something else. All right? That's what I'm trying to establish here. Hapax is the word in Greek. And it, uh, it can mean once for all. It means it only has to occur once, and after that, everything's done. All right? But at the same time, this could be, uh, you know, I he's talking in the past tense about his own compulsion to write, which means he's getting it from God. Okay? And yeah, the, the, the doctrine is once for all entrusted. See, he's using the word entrusted. He's not using the word written. He's using the word entrusted. And of course, saints is a term for New Testament believers. All right, it's also used in the Old Testament. But he's using it for a particular reason. Okay, so where are we going to go with this? All right, that's what I need to know. Okay, now from this point forward, he's referring to 2 Peter 2. Now what's different about this book and 2 Peter 2 is 2 Peter 2 was a prediction of false teachers. Second Peter 2 is playing on Matthew 23 where the Lord was predicting. Second Peter 2 is saying they're gonna be false teachers. Alright? And then he goes into a kind of a very long explanation about that and then Second Peter 3 is about how these false teachers will continue till the earth you know is blown up and you know what are you gonna do as a result of knowing this? 2 Peter 3.11, you know, what sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? And I'm using Boltmann when I say dedicated to God lifestyle in my pastor's translation when I translate Greek use of Baya that way. Okay, so for certain men condemnation was written long ago, have, have, are. And I, again, I'm trying to avoid using the Greek right now because if I slip back and forth, I'm afraid the recorder is not going to work. All right? This is past tense. It's already happened. That's why he's writing now. He was going to write about salvation and growing in Christ, which is why he's saying this, about the salvation we share. In other words, we're already saved. Now what do we do? That's what he wanted to write about. But instead he has to write about these false teachers. Okay? Right here. Because they have slipped among you, whoever the people are that he's writing to. Okay? Now he's got to spend all this time reminding them of Second Peter. Now, here's the point. Most of this letter is referring to Second Peter. If it's referring to Second Peter, okay, and he's reminding them, okay, reminding them, I want to remind you, if he's reminding them, it means that some time elapsed between 2 Peter and his letter. See, he's talking in the same way Peter does. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, I'm writing this to you to remind you. Okay? And Peter's coming out, you know, 10 years or so after the latest books that we got from Paul. And Peter closes 2 Peter by reminding them that, you know, Paul is canon. All right, so he's keying off Second Peter 2, saying that it's come true now. You've got false teachers in your midst. But he's saying, I want to remind you. So now he's going to go back through the content of Second Peter and add stuff. Okay? And the way he's going to add stuff is what's so remarkable. All right? So, this part here makes me think that there's like at least, you know, several years hiatus between 2 Peter, which was had to be written 68 AD, okay? Because Peter's writing to Paul's old stomping ground. He would have to do that if Paul died, okay? Because the mantle then has to fall to him because Paul is dead. Likewise, Jude, if Peter had died, would be writing Jude after the book of Peter to show, hi, I'm still here. Okay, he had control over what used to be the Jerusalem church, but they're now all in diaspora. They have been since 64. 
So what amount of hiatus, what delay is there between Jude and 2 Peter? That's the issue. Because in my earlier videos, I might need to correct them because I said in my RFG series, episode 5, that Jude came out in the same year as 2 Peter. I don't think that's necessarily true now. So I have to establish it. And then that leads to the question, well, is Jude even really a canonical book? Or is it written because of this phrase? Is it written after the book of Revelation and therefore it's just a sermon? Okay, that's what I'm trying to establish. I'll continue more in the next increment because I'm afraid my recorder is going to die. <laughs>